This business is like the Wild West. Gold, silver, rare coins, ancient weapons, lost treasures of history. You never know what's gonna walk through that door, but if the price is right, I always try and buy it. I'm Evan Kale, and this is Pawn Man. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Hey. Eh. Uh, yeah, eh is right. Welcome back. There's a whole bag of stuff. Ooh. Looks like mostly costume. Yeah, for a second. Mm -hmm. Is there any precious metal in here? Um, not so far. I don't see any. I'm not seeing any either. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I wouldn't want to pay more than like 20, 25 bucks on this stuff. It's, there's not much we can do with it. We have so much, so much just costume like this and a lot of it's broken anyways. We'll make it 30 because you came out from Maple Grove. Yeah. Hey you. Hey, so they're saying, um, 30 for all of it. It's not down. <laughs> okay. All right, well, sorry we couldn't make a deal today. No, but no, thanks for coming by and, you know, just keep us in mind in the future with anything. Oh, yeah. All right, we'll take it easy, man. Thank you, sir. I'll see you again. Yep. All right, step right up. How you doing? Good, man. How about yourself? Good, nice to see you. All right, more stuff coming in. Yes, sir. Ooh, you bought a lot of stuff today. Great. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, delight. Uh, we got platinum, we got gold, we got silver. Let's start with the gold. Yeah, this and then in here is proof sets. Oh, but, sweet. It's yeah. on the eBay bread and butter. Yeah, there you go. Let's start with these. Okay, these are all good. How's 1800 each on these? Good. How's 1795 on these two? That's fine. How's uh, these melt at 58 a gram, or 58 and a half? How's 58 each on them? Just full melt. These are half a gram, so you can right, 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 right. a gram. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay. Platinum, 10th ounce. I think it's under a grand, right? It's been bouncing back and forth. Under or over. 971. So how's 970? Or I mean 97 on each of these. Call it 100. How's 1925? 1406. Holy shit, so I didn't film everything because it was getting to be a bit of a long deal, but um, yeah, I just did like, almost like $36,000 here worth of worth of deals. So let me show you all what, what all we acquired and what I think I can make on it. So these are all proof sets that I bought from the 1950s and 60s. Like I'll probably make a hundred bucks on this one. I paid a median price of about $25 a proof set. The ones in the 60s are not as good. I get about 30 bucks each on those. I was paying 15. I was paying about basically 60 cents on the dollar for some of this stuff. This is 1,080. I bet by the time it's all said and done, once I'm done flipping it, I'll probably be at about $2,000. So yeah, I'll make maybe about 900 on this deal, but that's not where the real expensive stuff is. And then I had kind of a grumpy old guy came in after he sold me these. This is clad from 1997. You guys remember I had a gold coin that was like this. I went to TikTok jail over making a TikTok about a coin like this. So I'm not going to make another one because that cost me a lot of money. And this is like some kind of a challenge coin. But yeah, oh Deloitte right now. This is where the money is. So I bought 14 gold eagles below spot and I'm gonna be able to get above spot probably 125 to 150 over. So there's at least $1,500 there. These ones are graded. Probably be able to make about 100 bucks on these. I'll probably make about 300 on this. The platinum, I'll probably be able to make 20, 30 bucks over on. Again, I got some good gold coins, 100 bucks each on these. Yeah, all in all, maybe, maybe like $4,000 in profit from this deal. But keep in mind, you guys, I had to spend almost $35,000 to do that. So that's the problem with this business. You assume that I'm making head over fist money, 
hand over fist money. And indeed, I am I'm doing very well. This was a great day. If every day could be like this, I'd be a millionaire in a year. But look at the amount of capital I had to spend to do that. This is why I've been, you know, I'm talking on live, trying to raise more working capital here because it's really tough to do this business with the amount of money that I'm working on. And deals like this are happening more and more. It's, it's just tough. It's, uh, it is nothing short of a magic trick to be able to do this business the way that I am as successfully as I am with the amount of money that I'm working with. So thank you to my followers who loan me money. You see where your money's going? going now. Okay, now I finally sold these fucking Funko Pops. I've had them for like three months now. I can't believe it took me this long to sell them. I've had so many joke offers on eBay and people, for some reason, like they're all paying the same price. They make an offer for 700. I bought each box for $3, 100 boxes. I kept one, so 99 of them, trying to double my money, and I did. I got $7 a box after eBay fees and all the shipping, because I'm gonna have to do this in two big orders. It's gonna be, well, I guess we'll see. But I've had so many people make offers, and I accept it, and then they just, like, they ghost me, and then I have to cancel the order. And like, I don't know why you would do that, because it hurts, like, you can't do that on eBay. eBay keeps track of when you do that. And if you do that enough times, you can't be on eBay. So that has continued to happen. Finally, the person paid it was a person who made me an offer again last week for 700 and then they didn't pay. And then they reached out again. They're like, hey, I want to pay. And it's like, well, you're fucking paying more money now. So I charge them an extra $10 because, you know, I just wanted to sell them. So we're going to get these packaged up. This is going to be a bitch, but the joys of shipping. Like a UPS commercial. Come work for us and drive a big truck and wear a brown suit and have some anger issues. True story, when I was an Uber driver, a UPS driver like chased me for miles. I still to this day don't know what happened. I was dropping somebody off and like, like, start short, like I drove over someone's lawn and the UPS driver just started screaming at me and he jumped in his truck and he fucking chased me fast for mi like miles. And I, it was very strange. To this day, I don't know why he chased me. I mean, come on, you chased me, right? Look at me. Ha, 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 ha. I have work to do, my god. All right, I need a box big enough. It looks like, yeah, this is all I got, this giant Walmart box. It's Monday. So about 85 bucks to ship it all. It's not bad, it's cheaper than I thought. So there is my profit, $242.14. Not bad, it did take like three months to sell though. So you guys might remember this coin. This is my Spanish Real that I bought about six months ago. I paid, I think, $165 for it. I bought it from an individual. Uh, he's been on the show a couple of times. I mean, obviously you haven't seen his face. He's an older guy. Always brings in a bunch of coins. Usually takes up a ton of my time and I almost never do a deal with him because he just wants full worth on his coins. And he doesn't seem to understand that I'm running a business and I need to buy low and sell high or buy at a reasonable price so that I can make some money. Usually what happens is he'll come in here for an hour and the prices I offer to him, he's like, no, nah, I'm not gonna do that. And then I just don't do a deal and I just waste a bunch of time. So anyway, this is a coin I paid $165. He wanted 200 for it and I was like, no. I wanted to offer him 140 and he was like, no. So we met at 165, but I could not get it sold for the life of me. I was trying to get 250 on it, dropped the price to 225, couldn't get that, dropped the price to 200, couldn't get that, and I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna just send it into PCGS, because once it gets slabbed, I'll probably be able to get what I want. And sure enough, I did get $250 on this coin. You can see PCGS designated it as F detail with chop marks. We talked about this in episode 24 of Pawn Man. Chop marks are these things right here. These are mercantile stamps. Every time a merchant back in the day received one of these to ensure that it was good, they would put a chop mark on it. This mark here, it's their own merchant stamp. And so each one of these you see, I think they're all different. So each one of these represents a different merchant. But you'll notice it says F detail. And that's because technically each time this got a chop mark, it got damaged. This coin has been damaged. It's just these chop marks are part of this coin's life and story. And I can't, I'm trying to think, I can't think of any other coins where that's, that's the case. Where some damage that occurs to the coin is actually part of the coin's life and origin and story. So I got 250 on this coin. Uh, I was a little hesitant to sell it just because I went through the trouble of sending it in. It's a cool old coin, but I will definitely see more of these. I've had Spanish reals come in in the past and I'm making 90 bucks on this, so I'm fine with that. Here he comes, here he comes, here he comes, oh boy. Hello, how you doing? How you doing? Come on in. All right, why don't you have me in this bag here? So I want to show you some jewelry. Oh. You got some jewelry today. 
Well, you got some jewelry, eh? Well, that's exciting. Okay, so is this stuff? Why don't you have a seat? Yeah, Oh, you got some jewelry there too? You can just set it right here. Yeah. The best you can, sir. Eh? We got another Muffy Bear. Yes, sir. Got a lot of those in the basement, you know. Okay. You know, I got a whole bin for you <laughs> in my basement. <laughs> sure, man. Do the best you can. Brought me a light fixture. Yeah. I don't really have a use for a placard that says dance hall, mainly because I don't dance. Yeah. Well, I had this thing, I get drunk enough, I call it white walking, uh -huh. but it's not dancing. Uh -huh. It's, it's uh, more close to an epileptic seizure than it is dancing. Oh. Um, do, do, do the best you can. Uh, okay, see, if you, know, if you always brought me this kind of stuff, then I'd be happy, because this is my area, this kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Okay, this so other stuff, I... I Buy it because it's it's all content gravy. Yeah, look at that watch barely. in there, dude. You, you, you like that watch? It's, that's pretty nice. All right, so we have a okay. This is a good piece. It's a did cameo. You, did you like that, sir? Bracelet. Uh, it's solid. It's steel. It's not silver. I'm proud of you. When you you run this business, I'm proud of you. Uh, thank thank you. Uh, I'd be at twenty bucks for the stuff. Again, uh, I have a building pile in my basement of stuff I bought from you that I haven't sold. And although I've sold a few items, I'm definitely negative in this relationship because I paid more than I've gotten back. So would you go 25 today? That made me happy. Yeah, I'm going to hold it 20. That's fine. All right. All right. Let me get you 20 bucks. All right. Thank you. Jesus H. Christ. Anyway, before I was interrupted, so I bought this yesterday from this Russian mover that I know. He's come in here. He helped move in these cases. This is from a Soviet bank, and these are, I mean, I might be able to get like 150, 200 bucks in this thing. I traded him just a tiny amount of silver, 50 bucks worth of silver for this, and this, and this. And I don't know, he didn't know, and I don't know what these are, but this, like I said, is from a Russian bank, and I couldn't find anything on the internet like it. I found something kind of close, kind of sorta, not really, and that was 150, so this is bigger and rarer. Probably, like I said, get 150 to 200 bucks on this. And this is something I'd like to keep, but alas, running a business. So I have a treasure here that I actually can't buy because it's made of ivory. This is a Japanese mask, Lokapala ivory mask. Uh, it's from 1905 Japan. I have an appraisal slip in front of me for over $6,000. But unfortunately, because of Minnesota law, I'm not allowed to buy any kind of ivory. And just with the price, I mean, it's probably out of my price range anyway. But it is quite a cool treasure. And I just really wanted to show this off because I never see cool stuff like this. What's it actually worth? I don't know. It's, uh, this person here is, I suspect gonna have a hard time trying to sell it just because being in Minnesota, you have to be so careful with selling this stuff. What I recommended she do is just donate it to a museum and write it off. And I think that's what she's probably gonna do. But let me just show you guys a little closer. And that I love Japanese, all things Japanese. I really do wish I could have this, but uh, it's just not worth potentially the trouble. I also see, it looks like there's like some writing right there, but I don't know how to appraise ivory. So like, I don't know exactly how much something like this could actually be worth. I mean, it does look like a museum piece. But every time I see an appraisal slip, the price is always grossly inflated. So I don't know if this $6,000 auction appraisal is accurate or not, but boy, what a cool piece of history. I have a very interesting piece of military in front of me here. So this is a purple heart. I think it is from 1933, because it says uh, 31733. So these purple hearts, uh, this is actually the oldest US military medal. They started during the Revolutionary War on August 7th, 1782. In fact, George Washington designed the first purple heart. The badge of military merit is what it was originally called, and it was awarded to emeritus soldiers during the Revolutionary War. There were only three recipients. They're all non-commissioned officers of the Continental Army. And the current version was instituted in 1932, mainly to honor World War I vets because so many people were so hurt, all those veterans coming back from that horrible, horrible war. So I'm thinking, because this is, I think from 1933, this gentleman probably served in World War I. So although it was introduced in 1932, it was retroactive to April 5th, 1917. And the current version was awarded to any soldier or civilian national of the US while serving under competent authority in army capacity since April 5th, 1917. And it's anyone who's been wounded, killed, or may die of their injuries, or anybody who's a victim of terrorism, or anybody who's a POW. It's a heart-shaped medal 
it has a profile of George Washington over a purple backdrop. This interestingly is George Washington's family coat of arms. And when you turn the medal over, it'll have the person's name on it. So this guy was Fred Davis for military merit. So because this comes in the original box and it's so old, I mean, you can expect to pay anywhere from 30 to 80, 90 dollars. I have this at 85. This is one of the higher end ones because it's older and it's got this box that still goes with it. As you all know, I love selling controversial items. However, it makes me a pinch uncomfortable to sell this. I'm still gonna sell it. Because Stolen Valor is like really not cool to me and I just, I worry that whoever I sell this to is gonna put it on and that's so not okay. You cannot put on a military medal if you didn't earn it. Simple as that. Even if you're in the military right now, if you bought this from me, like you can't, you have to earn this. You can't just put it on. So it, it makes me a pinch uncomfortable, but I'm still gonna sell it. Let you know how it goes. I just made a TikTok about it. Juliet was like, oh, you're getting the Kim shirt on. What are you getting it on for? I just got some North Korean currency. I found a guy on Reddit who sells it and I bought a bunch from him. Check this stuff out. So this is set from 2003. I think I should be really careful. These notes are like totally uncirculated. I don't know how this guy gets them. This guy's based out of Poland. So we have a 1978 set. I wish that currency was this cool. Of course, that currency is actually worth something. I have a socialist set, a bond set, a 2018 to 19 set, a 5 1, a 500 1, and a 5000 1. Then I also, from the same guy, some Syrian currency with a sod on it. And I got some Cuban currency. And holy shit, this stuff is like mint too. You know, I figured I'm trafficking in Nazi shit and controversial items like North Korea. I may as well throw a little Assad and a little Cuba in there as well. Oh, here's some more Assad. What a handsome looking evil eye surgeon. And then of course, to go with the Korean currency, this was advertised. I saw somebody on Instagram had this a couple weeks ago and I was like, oh, perfect timing. This is the, it's made from brass, but is the anti-US aid to North Korea helmet. It's like a commemorative of the goddamn Western influence in the, in the Korean War. So I'm gonna sell this with that as well. And let's make a very tasteful TikTok. Very tasteful. Okay, I got them all laid out. So this one is the Bond set. This is the 1978 set. I think this one's the best. And then this is the 2018 to 19 commemorative set. And then this is a 5,505 And then this is the socialist set here. So I got about 350 bucks into these notes. I bet I can make 150, 200 bucks pretty easily on it because it's really hard to get this stuff. I had to go down a fucking internet rabbit hole to find it. Oh, I knew this would go fast. I haven't even posted the TikTok yet. I just took some pictures for my Discord to get ahead of the TikTok crowd. And within a couple seconds, I sold these three, the 5,505 one at 39. And then I sold this 2018 set. I'm making about 50 bucks on this deal. So not bad. I'm definitely gonna be doing more business with this guy I found on well, I don't wanna say where I found him. I don't wanna reveal my source. All right, guys, for this informative segment, we are talking all about the Republic of Minerva. And if you're like, Pawn Man, I've never heard of the Republic of Minerva because it's a micronation that, that I mean, it's a country that wasn't. From this day forth, this territory will be known as Pretoria. This, you guys, is a fascinating story. So I have said this again and again, I do not want to get political uh, in Pawn Man. However, this is a story about libertarians. I find myself on the libertarian spectrum quite often. However, the problem with libertarianism is it seems like a great idea until you get into the execution. And I got this story from the podcast Behind the Bastards. Robert Evans and Sophie Lichterman do a fabulous podcast. I listen to it every week and they covered this about two months ago and I've never heard of this story. And the reason why I want to cover it here has to do with the coin aspect, which we will get into after I tell the story. It's such an incredible story. It's so hilarious. It like, this story just feels like it should be a Wes Anderson movie. Uh, I'm surprised this hasn't been made into a movie. Probably because it fizzled out so quickly. It is, it's hilarious. But the the episode in Behind the Bastards of Robert Evans is talking this talking about the story. He's not just talking about Minerva. It's all about libertarian seafaring expenditures. How libertarians numerous times have attempted to create these island nations, and it just hilariously does not work out every single time. And what happens is again and again is they basically accidentally invent government, and that's just the problem with libertarianism. Is it's a great idea. It don't work. Same with communism. Great idea, don't work. So with that, let's get into this fascinating story of what all happened in the Republic of Minerva. So there's a gentleman 
named Michael Oliver, who in the late 1960s, very much like Nelson Bunker Hunt, was disturbed at what was taking place in the political climate of America. He was seeing violence, mass unrest. The counterculture movement was very scary to people that were more conservative, shall we say. Between, you know, Martin Luther King being assassinated, all the violence that happened after that, Vietnam, all the economic instability, which is kind of what more Nelson Bunker Hunt was into. He sees bad things on the horizon, so he wants to build a utopia free of all this stuff. And also, this utopia that he wants to build, a little bit of a racist connotation to it. It's like, you know, oh, we don't like what's going on in America. It, it, as you're looking at the story, like, you just, you can't help but see that there's some white white supremacy going on here, but it's neither here nor there. So Michael Oliver is a millionaire in the late 1960s. He's made his money in real estate. He is a self-proclaimed real estate mogul and coin collector who is a libertarian. And in, again, the late 1960s, he's so disillusioned by the state of affairs in America that he wants to create this new libertarian utopia and he wants to do it on an island. So what does he do? He gets together a couple investors and they start looking for places in the Pacific where they could potentially build this island. What he wants to do, start it small, turn it into a 400 acre resort, go from there, create a, well, <laughs> a land free of government that basically has government, if you will. So what this is, it is a micro nation. Micro nations are nations that are so tiny they're either not recognized outright or they're just laughable experiments that have gone on way too long. Like, for example, Sealand is a great example if you guys know what Sealand is. So the land that he finds was discovered in 1818. A captain named John Nicholson put the reefs on the map. He was the first one to chart them. The reefs became known as Nichols Shoal. But then on September 9th, 1829, an Australian whaler named the Minerva hits the reefs and sinks. So then in 1854, another captain renames them the Minerva Reefs. Now how exactly Michael Oliver found this tiny little patch of land that is barely above sea level, I don't know. But he finds this reefs and in the early 1970s, he starts putting out ads in libertarian magazines. He's advertising an escape from high taxes, drugs, and crime. So he intends to build a 400 acre plot of land on these reefs, turn it into a resort, get more investors, go from there. He gets two investors right away. And ultimately his goal is a land of zero taxes, zero subsidies, zero welfare, zero government interference, zero regulation, a libertarian's paradise. So starting in 1971, once he has enough money via his own and these two backers, he starts hiring these boats to just start dumping sand. And I'm not talking little boats, I'm talking barges and they are dumping sand and sand and sand making trip after trip after trip. Once he has enough sand he and his co-founder Morris C. Davis they build a little tower out of stone and they plant this flag that they designed. And then what do they do once they have their tiny little tower? They issue a declaration of independence to all the nations around there stating their principles stating that they are forming their own nation. Well, fast forward, I don't know, a month, two months later, they have, they are eight feet above sea level now, and they have about 15 acres of land that they have created just by dumping sand. And again, I, I couldn't find any estimates how much this cost. This could not have been cheap. So what do they do though? They use this 15 acres that they now have. Now they're trying to get even more investors, even more money, probably because they're running out of money. But what they don't realize, and if you're thinking like, boy, I didn't realize it was that easy to set up a nation. It's not. There's this thing called sovereign territory. And by declaring independence on someone's territory, you know, like geopolitics isn't a lunchroom. You can't just sit down and take someone's M&M and, &M and oh, I just took your M&M. In geopolitics, that is a declaration of war. That is a serious thing. You can't just take someone's stuff. So right after this declaration of independence comes out, Fiji, New Zealand, Australia, the Cook Islands, Tonga, Samoa, and Nauru. They have a conference and it's like, do you guys get this piece? Do you guys see what this jackass is doing? Okay, whose problem is this? They look at the map, they decide that it's Tonga's problem. So Tonga now has to make a sovereign claim on the land. The first thing that they do to establish ownership over the land, and this to me is hilarious, is they drop supplies on, on this tiny little hunk of, of sand. The reason being is they're saying, this is our land. We see you stranded there. We're here to help because it's our land. Which also, if you're a libertarian and you're building a utopia to hide from governments and then you get government assistance, it's just such a funny slap in the face to me. So first they drop supplies and Tonga also issues a proclamation from their king. Let me read the proclamation. The reefs known as North Minerva Reef and South Minerva Reef have long served as fishing grounds for the Tongan people and have been regarded 
and belonging to the Kingdom of Tonga has now created on these reefs islands known as Taliki, Tokelau, and Taliki, Tonga, and whereas it is expended that we should now confirm the rights of the Kingdom of Tonga to these islands, therefore, we do affirm and proclaim that the islands, rocks, reefs, and forest shores, and waters lying within a radius of 12 miles thereof are part of our Kingdom of Tonga. In other words, that's our sovereign territory, not you. We will fight you for it. And fight they did. Though, I mean, we're not talking about a battle of Waterloo here. Right after Tonga claims the territory as its own, Michael Oliver fires his president, Morris C. Davis, and he kind of goes into panic mode. Meanwhile, mind you guys, there's nobody occupying and guarding this. Like, they, they leave and they come back and they leave and they come back. The Tongan military on June 18th of 1972 just invades and claims it, and that's it. It's, it's, they lose it. They lose all the money that they put into this plot of sand in the island. They lose everything. They lose the flag. They lose their shitty little tower that they built. Gone. Seized. But this will not be the end of the Republic of Minerva. I mean, territorially. Yes, it is the end of it. But Michael Oliver isn't done here. And this is like a grift that lives on. What exactly was the end goal of this guy? Did he really think that this was possible? I feel like this guy was just too smart to know that this was going to work. I think he was trying to build into some kind of a bigger grift because, well, in the episode of Behind the Bastards where they dig into this stuff, a lot of these, most of them turn out to be grifts. And I feel like some way or another this was. What Oliver ends up doing is he continues this trying to raise money for this utopia by minting coins. So this is it right here, the Minerva dollar, 35 Minerva dollars. He started minting these coins and advertising them in libertarian magazines as the finest coin ever made. It's made from pure silver overlaid with gold. So we have 10 grains of 24 karat gold, and then it's just pure silver. Now, as far as the coin itself goes, I will give Oliver this. This is a really, really good looking coin. I think this is one of the best eye appeal coins potentially I've ever seen. I just love this design. I love the overlay of both gold and silver. It is just such a great design like. I am very cognizant that a man who is a coin collector who knew a lot about coins designed this coin. So I will say for all, all the blunders and failures of the Republic of Minerva, boy, at least he got one thing right. This is a really good looking coin. The melt value on this coin is about $80. This is what is known as a fantasy coin. Um, I do have one, unfortunately it's not here. I had to buy it in Poland. I bought a graded one from PCGS. It's a proof 68, but it says fantasy. Um, in fact, I do have a picture of it. So this is the one that I bought. You'll see it says PCGS proof 68 cameo X number one fantasy. And I've never, sent a fantasy coin in to get graded. What I like about this one is this one has really good toning. And I'll tell you guys about my little scheme. So Brad Goss recently, the TikToker, I'm very friendly with him. If you guys don't check him out, please check him out. He's so funny. Um, but he is a coin collector too. And he, about six months ago, attempted to corner the market on Chuck E. Cheese tokens from the 1980s. And he had some success. He bought all of them. And he was doing this for a long time in secrecy. And then when they started to get more scarce and he started driving up the price, uh, then he kind of announced, or at least he told me what he was doing. And like at that point he had, I don't even know how many he has now, but he successfully drove up the price on those. And I would kind of like to do that with these. There are 10,000 of these in existence. I have, I have a couple of them. Uh, now I have this one, I have another one coming. I have the graded one coming. I'm currently bidding on another one. And I have been watching eBay like a hawk. Uh, just know you guys, if you wanna buy one of these coins, I'm gonna make it difficult for you because I am actively trying to buy these. I'm gonna always have them in my store. I love the talking piece. I love the story behind it. Admittedly, the, the, the getting going of the story is more interesting than the execution itself. It's like, oh, they're just a bunch of boobs that got their territory seized by a legitimate military. But it's, it's very, very, very funny to me. And I, like I said, this coin, I think, is just such a good design. There's only 10,000 of them. I wonder how many were melted down. I wonder how many are out there. I couldn't get any kind of a population size in the research that I did. I would estimate half of them have disappeared. So I would estimate there's about 5,000 of these left. According to Robert Evans, the Behind the Bastards host, there's a $75 one that's gold, but I looked online, I couldn't find, I'm not sure if that was a mistake on his part or not. I couldn't find one. Um, I can't imagine how expensive a gold one would be or how many of those are out there. But there's, like I said, 10,000 of these silver overlaid with gold ones minted. Melt volume's about 80 bucks and I'm getting them. Um, they're currently about 200. Uh, what's interesting is the first one that I bought, I bought one right after I listened to the Behind the Bastards episode. 
and I paid 150 and I've been paying 200 now on them. So I wonder if, cause his podcast is pretty big. I wonder if he kind of educated people about them and now they're actively looking for them. But just know you guys, I am gonna be fiercely bidding on these. If you're trying to get them, your easier, your best bet is to get them through me. Cause I'm just, I'm gonna, at least as far as eBay goes, I'm gonna scoop them all up. I have my research, I have other people looking for me for them. So it's gonna be hard to get them. I almost forgot, uh, closing the story off. The founder, Michael Oliver, died without succeeding in this endeavor. Um, but interestingly, the, the president that he fired, his co-founder, Morris Davis, attempted to take the island back again in 1982. He and a group of others went by boat to what, whatever was left of the sand that they dumped. I can't imagine there's very much left. And they were there for like all of three weeks. And then the Tongan military came back and was like, did we not make this clear? Fuck off. And they did. And that's the story of the Republic of Minerva. Yeah, I just think it's funny how libertarianism is such a... It's a great idea that never works. Never. Yep. All right, guys, just like that, it is the end of the day and the end of the episode. If you guys like this video, be sure you give it a thumbs up. Become a Pawn Man Patreon. Every dollar I get goes toward improving the show. Get my books on Amazon. Follow me on social media at Pawn Man, at Evan Kale. And I will see you guys back here for another episode of Pawn Man. Later, guys.